Louise Ashcroft. Louise is working with performances, writing, video, sculpture, radio and participatory experiences and describes her art as an attempt to disrupt social, bureaucratic and economic systems which have power over us. Louise graduated from the Ruskin School of Art, Birkbeck, and studied sculpture at the Royal College of Art. She has exhibited widely, for instance, at BQ Berlin, Latitude Festival, or on BBC Radio. Louise is co-founder of the Free Art School Alt-FMA and teaches art at Goldsmith College. Today she introduces us to her work, or let's say ways of Speaking fiction to power, let's give a warm welcome and applause to Louise Ashcroft. Hi. Is this working? Um, so I'd like you all to find an object that you've got in your bag or in your pocket and then hold them up, uh, whatever you've got. The most interesting thing, it doesn't have to be that interesting. I mean, I guess there won't be anything really unusual and you might want to hide it if it is too unusual. Um, and then I thought we could try to link them together to open source a narrative of some kind. What's that? Okay, we've got a photo of... A photo of, is that you, hugging yeah. a dog? Okay, a photo of someone hugging a dog. Um, the last drop, the politics of water. How might those two things link together? So we've got the dog, there's a last drop. Would you give the dog the last drop of water before you drank it? If there was, who comes first, you or the dog? <laughs> there's some kind of, there's something about water, there's something about dogs, what else have we got? Is this, what is that, a cigar or a pen or a lighter? It's a knife. It's a knife. Okay, we've got a knife. <laughs> so will the dog be eaten if the, um, I mean, this is clearly an apocalyptic scenario. Um, who, who, something's happening with the knife and there's only a bit of water left. What have we got here? Pills. Pills, right. We've got some really good objects. <laughs> I was just expecting like water bottles. Okay, so that what's lactrase? Is that what does it do? For drinking milk. Okay, for drinking milk. So you can drink milk if you have those, but you can't if you don't. I didn't even know they existed. So um, we've got the water and that. Maybe a chemical reaction might happen if we add something else. What's this here? Oh, uh, some kind. Right, a tea, but it's very acidic. There's a kind of alchemical or chemistry. Maybe we're trying to make a, a new material. Um, There's, are they earmuffs to help to uh, drown out the sound of the barking um, from the dog as the experiment that whatever is being done to the dog with the chemicals and maybe the dog is going on some kind of a, um, a trip um, so psychologically or physically, we don't know. Um, what, oh, an inhaler, right, okay, to calm things down perhaps. Um, And this is a reflector for when it, with a, uh, there's a, is that a horse or a, with a horse, a reflector for a horse. So there's now a horse and a dog. Um, I think we just need two more things because otherwise it will be the whole talk. Um, this one, right. Uh, what, oh, a hammer. And is that another hammer or what is this? Socket wrench. A socket wrench. Okay. So can someone please do some of the work? Um, What, what would this, maybe for testing the reflexes of the dog before it goes uh, on its excursion and, the, and this also for sockets, uh, maybe just to tighten up some of its ligaments. Um, we'll have one more, oh, maybe th this is quite nice then, isn't it? I'm glad that you've got that on you just in case. So perhaps this will be how it does fly up. It's got its passport there as well. Um, We don't need to finish the story, but I just wanted to... You can do that yourselves afterwards, or you can do that in your heads. But I think it's quite nice that you could open source uh, a story or a film. Maybe there's someone who can fund that film, and we'll talk about it later. Um, I quite like the idea of sort of hacking the audience. And when I use the word hacking, I use it wrongly in the superficial way that somebody who has really very little knowledge of technology might have like me. So I apologize if I kind of continually use this fairly superficial idea of, of, of hacking, which comes from a very non-specialized position of uh, an artist who's very much involved in 
physical things. I did promise that I would bring a load of props uh, today, but then I realized that I couldn't really get them in my luggage, and I decided to bring pants instead of all the objects, and that's why I sourced them from you lot. And they were much more interesting objects than what I had. I've, uh, usually I use quite a lot of props in my practice, and um, I use them to kind of intervene in public space in different ways, most of which reveal the futility of the individual trying to confront big capitalism or, or state control. Uh, and often they fail to really change the world, but maybe just for a moment they change the psychological space of being uh, in public space. So I describe the sort of tactic as anarcho-comedy, I suppose, playing the world wrongly to create moments of confusion, and that confusion can be resistance to power. So, for example, um, this up at the top corner, uh, I started collecting the surface of Mayfair, which is an area of London which is very rich, and it's owned by Gerald Cavendish Groves. Actually, he's died now, but his son the UK's most eligible bachelor, apparently. Uh, this kind of aristocratic landowner owns Mayfair. And um, so I'm collecting the surface, all of the receipts and rubbish and dust and everything, and posting it back to the landowner who lives in Chester in the north of England, uh, so that he'll receive all this detritus and kind of physicalize um, Mayfair, which to him is just an asset on an Excel spreadsheet. So thinking about how you might um, kind of directly connect uh, uh, an owner of land uh, with the, the sort of grit of that place by literally posting it. I always think about who owns the land beneath your feet. And in England, that uh, often is some aristocrat or some public school, some, which means private school, confusingly. So some kind of rich person. Um, and it hasn't really changed for a long time. And even increasingly, public space is being sold off to, um, to big companies and uh, hedge funds and pension funds. And um, so it's actually getting worse. Uh, these vegetables here, there's a, an intervention that I do where I buy uh, the most unusual looking vegetable that I can find from a local market and then I take it into a supermarket and I try to buy it along with the rest of my shopping <laughs> and the cashier doesn't know what it is, often their colleague doesn't know what it is, the supervisor doesn't know what it is the deputy manager and then the senior manager. And in some cases, I've been lucky enough to meet the main manager of the Marks and Spencers food store. Um, but what I really wanted to do was to take that flow of the way things work in a quite mechanical way with the humans as part of that machine and to open up conversations um, and um, to give agency back to the people so that, um, well, mainly the conversations were about the taxonomy of vegetables and whether it was a carrot or a marrow or whether they should put it through as a carrot or a marrow. And I did spend quite a lot of money on it. I think I've donated a lot of money to Tesco's and Sainsbury's um, so uh, this aesthetic and anesthetic, it's just a switch that I carry around with me and when it's on anesthetic things are slightly duller and it is like a placebo really and when it's on aesthetic things just um, brighten up a bit. Uh, a lot of these things are more for me, like this trowel in the top corner uh, it uh, sometimes if I feel like completely powerless I might dig a hole in the ground and put my head in it so that I can imagine wearing the entire earth as a giant <laughs> head um, but other things have more of a tangible uh, political impact like this is uh, it's uh, seeds that attract bats and um, because, obviously, you know, the uh, 18, 
27 Wildlife and Countryside Act, uh, which uh, prohibits building work to take place in, when there are bats present. Um, so uh, if you attract bats to a building that's about to undergo um, like renovation or become a luxury apartment, which is pretty much every industrial building in London, um, bats are a really good way of resisting what artists do, which is gentrify areas. So I'm kind of cancelling myself out, I like to think, with that. Um, this was a mask that I used. Um, so I started building these belts, which had extensions, and I would go on the the underground train and attempt to stop crowds from forming. So I would keep uh, this distance, the personal space boundary, from myself. It was an anti-crowd belt, but then it didn't really work. People just crushed it instantly. And um, when I wore this mask instead, people kept an average of um, about <laughs> two meters away. So that worked a little bit better. And the, at the top there, there's some perfume, um, quite kind of stereotypically feminine perfume um, that I carry around and I spray on all the statues in uh, London. So if you do go to London and smell some of the stonework of the statue, you'll find that the sort of patriarchal, uh, macho quality of the statue is, is start, uh, slightly reduced by um, the feminine scent that it's radiating so really, it doesn't do much, but just creates moments of highlighting uh, the structures that are there already in playful ways. I think these was, yeah, this is a bouquet that I regularly make uh, bouquets of uh, flowers from like, hotels and uh, banks and corporate flower displays. So kind of taking one, maybe graves as well, not, not always graves, and make these corporate bouquets. That's a Santander red from outside the one in um, Liverpool Street. And I, uh, I like pointing. This photography glove is actually just to remind me that pointing is really the new photography or the new old photography. And really all my work is is just pointing. Like you, I don't really like to do it, but you can create quite a lot of tension by pointing at someone now or in public space. And Three-year-olds do that all the time, but we forget that pointing is really powerful. And um, I would sometimes do this walk where I would start in Greenwich um, in London, and I would walk uh, into the Docklands where all the big bank buildings are, the tallest building in Canary Wharf, one Canada Square. Uh, it wants to be looked at. It, it, it deliberately tries to stand out. Uh, but I'd walk pointing towards it for a, a mile or two, and then um, it would always be in my line of sight, and it would always be commanding the attention of the skyline. And um, as I got right up to the building, the security guard would inevitably cover my, my finger, um, and I realized it wanted to be looked at from afar, but as soon as you looked at it on the ground, it... Um, that was a terrorist threat. So I've done lots of pointing at buildings and seeing how long it takes before I'm stopped. Um, I find that when you say that you're an artist, you can get away with a lot more than, uh, because you start explaining the concept to uh, the security guard and they really have very little experience in dealing with um, a sort of philosophical question that you might ask them. Um, there isn't really a protocol for that. And so, um, I start to have interesting conversations with security guards as well, and they start to um, have that creative moment in their day, I guess. And, and um, I think being knowingly naive is a really good strategy for, uh, for sort of hacking reality, because the idiot is very powerful. I mean, jesters... For, for like hundreds of years, jesters have been used to, uh, even commissioned by kings and queens to, uh, to question authority, even their own authority. So almost like the jester is a vent for power. Um, and I tell the stories of these things at gigs and 
comedy or art or performance nights. Uh, and I didn't really want to record me actually doing these things because it felt like then it's just videos of people looking at me do, doing something weird. It kind of co-opts it really easily. Whereas when you use it as a rumor, it becomes more of a recipe for something that anyone else could do. Like this lady's definitely thinking of doing it herself. Um, <laughs> and I do need all the help I can get. Um, so if you could all start doing some of these gestures and find your own as well, um, that would be great. And that's me again telling some people about something. Um, so other gestures that I've done, my friend was having an exhibition in her house. So I took some of the carpet from her front room and uh, started to occupy little parts of space. Uh, this is uh, on the street where the Bank of England is, Threadneedle Street. And um, so this is, I think, another bank building. So there are little, there are sort of legal um, necessities for, um, so yeah, there needs to be a gap between two buildings uh, because of some kind of planning thing. And so these little in-between spaces become places where people smoke or where homeless people might shelter or where I might um, kind of occupy with the carpet from my friend's house. I, I quite like the fact that there are these offcuts, which um, they are magnets for like marginalized activity. Um, so I wanted to really like highlight that again and, and to kind of claim the bits of space that are really some of the only bits of space that are left um, in, in London because everything is so corporate and this is uh, a gesture that I did where I've been collecting land from all over London particularly in these um, former public spaces that are now privatized uh, and posting them back to their international landowners who have probably never been there but who own parts of King's Cross or um, yeah this Qatari uh, sovereign wealth fund um, it costs quite a lot of money, to be honest, and I haven't been able to do all of them, but, um, you know, it's for the cause. And the, the fact that they might just get part of this land, like, it, it, I want to reveal the absurdity that's inherent in advanced capitalism, because sometimes, like, my mum might say, oh, well, you don't want to be too extreme, you know, you've got to live in the real world, you know, this is reality, the fact that Jeff Bezos owns like more than than a bunch of countries. This is this is just the real world. But actually, when we think about it um, in a comedic way, it becomes and in a literal way, it, it is actually a ridiculous idea that um, that one person might own so much. I did a residency at Tate. Modern and Tate Britain, um, the big public galleries, and they are trying to get uh, more children from the schools around the local area um, who often, they haven't been to galleries before, to come and visit. And so I was one of a few artists in residence who were working with the school's visits for a, a year. And um, I would write to the Prime Minister with them, this is a former Prime Minister, uh, and uh, we would take the newspaper of the day and we would cut it all up and make nonsense stories with it and then send it to the Prime Minister. And they came up with some really dark stuff. But this is a very posh girls' school, actually. Um, we had a variety of different types of schools. I really like that they signed it with like Ruby and Lottie and Phoebe and... Amani and Maddie and Daisy and all names that end in E. And uh, so I asked them, I said, do you think that confusion could be political? And they were like, oh, we, we feel confused by the gallery. or oh, we don't really like it. or oh, we feel like we don't understand it. It makes us feel stupid. And by the end, we talked more about confusion and their unease with confusion around art. And um, they decided that actually... Like every group really decided that confusion did have this really powerful kind of 
resistance inherent in it? Because if you send the Prime Minister that, they don't think, oh, they want us to spend a bit more on education. They have to think, what, do, what does this mean? And, like, that is not a passive position. That's a very active position when you have to take responsibility for your own interpretation of something. So I think ambiguity and confusion and chaos, maybe that's where that sort of anarchic uh, quality that, that hacking can have relates to what I do and vice versa. And I made these pocket squares. You can't really see, but um, I was doing a project in Croydon in South London, and um, there was the youth court where all of the naughty young people go uh, to have their trials, and they'd scratch their names in the door at the back bit where they go out to smoke. And um, so I photographed that, and I thought I really liked it because it was a naughty little playful moment of resistance where they, even at the court, they'd scrawled their names in. And so I sent it to uh, the new um, council reps who uh, had they just had a new a new team employed because the record uh, of youth care was so bad in the borough that um, they'd had to sack everyone and, and get some new people in. They're paying them an absolute fortune, and I thought to go with their luxury Savile Row suits, they might need an edgy pocket square uh, featuring this design of the graffiti to just kind of remind them, I guess, of the the physicality of what it means to be a, a disenfranchised youth in that um, area. This is a piece that I did where I took Investopedia and the Urban Dictionary and found words that were similar in both, or the words which were the same in both, but I just put the definitions together. Um, often I use collage, so this is a kind of collage conceptually taking two things and putting them together and seeing what happens when you read one through another. And I'm not really sure what happens, apart from that it reveals that specialist language is alienating and if we, uh, if we removed specialist language from a lot of things, then it would be way more accessible. Um, so I really wanted to reveal the humor in that as well as that. Like, we can see that slang is, is humorous and sort of um, playful, but also this becomes nonsense. And um, I wanted to use them to, I wanted to take the power away from the investment language by um, showing it as equal to this, uh, this sort of colloquial language. Um, querying, querying, confusing. We talked a bit about that. But they, these are the sort of deep dives into particular spaces that I've been doing, uh, particularly uh, spaces of commerce. So I did a project in a shopping centre unofficially, but I spent a few months in residence in a, a Westfield shopping centre in London. And I led these retail therapy walks so people could come and I advertised it online and strangers came and I'd do these walks where we would reclaim the mall as a, almost like a studio for creative practice. That involved writing stories, um, dressing up in costumes, imagining what people would have been like that lived there hundreds of years ago when it was an agricultural area. Um, we made a, a grime track with a local rapper, but the space where he used to rap was no longer there because a lot of the um, community spaces and um, the like, recording studios and things that were there before the mall came um, had sort of pushed people further out. Uh, we, uh, we wrote to CEOs of, we wrote nonsense letters to CEOs of some of the shops. There was a tattoo on the leg of this model in this photo. It says, um, trust no one on the tattoo. I noticed things that I wouldn't have noticed uh, that were kind of ominous about the marketing, apocalyptic advertising. Like this woman with the tattoo 
she's on TK Maxx, and she's got just cracked earth, like a desert of cracked earth behind her as a kind of stylish backdrop. And the more that I looked into the space of the shopping centre, the more that I realised there was this kind of apocalypse chic. Um, and the T-shirts were a source of great inspiration. Uh, I'll tell you a bit more about that in a second. But I made a mall game, a kind of... It's not really like Mon Monopoly, but it sounded nice. And I could use the logo perfectly by chopping it up to make this new logo uh, at the Westfield Shopping Centre logo. And uh, it, I handed out these games uh, that were instructions of how to use them all in a different way to people in the mall. So I've got loads of copies. If anyone wants one, just, um, just contact me and... Uh, send me like a stamped address envelope because my bedroom's got quite a lot of them. It's getting really annoying. Like, I've handed a lot out, but... Um, so, yeah, I suppose I wanted to... Because uh, in accelerationism, the idea of overthrowing big capitalism by taking it to its extreme, like get loads of credit cards, max them out, buy everything, do what it wants you to do, but in an extreme way, so it implodes. Um, sort of a bit like that like if you love the products in in the shopping center and you use them and you play with them and you get excited by them but you don't take them out of the shop then you you do everything that it wants you to do but you don't kind of do the final thing which is give profit to shareholders um so i'm interested in like the rules and then using the rules to like mess with the aims of those rules, loopholes and rules and gaps in rules. That's kind of what I'm trying to do. And during my residency, I noticed that there were loads of t-shirts with like phrases on them. And then next to the shopping center, there was a boating community along the River Lee, which is in the Olympic Village in Stratford in East London. So I realized that there were connections between the slogans on the t-shirts and the slogans on the boats. So that one, and then this escape plan, um, liquid lunch, I'll be there in a Prosecco. Um, there were loads about Prosecco, to be honest, so mainly about Prosecco and feminism, but like they were all made by H&M and, um, yeah, like made in sweatshops. Uh, so, yeah, this and... Like, it, you couldn't even... Once I'd made that connection, the, there were boat names that you'd never have thought of. There was one called Me, just Emmy, and there were lots of T-shirts about sort of self-centeredness. And it was like, I couldn't... I think once you make a connection, things just sort of appear. Um, and I did a workshop with some with like local people where we painted slogans from the shopping center but in this traditional boat style really as a way of slowing down the fast fashion rhythm and like focusing on what it might mean to be totally over it and uh what happens if you play one idea through another idea or one voice through another voice change the accent of, of the shopping centre to the accent of the, um, of the boating community. And then I did some big ones, because if you have a gallery exhibition, you have to do some big ones and put them on the wall. And the mallopoly things were shown on these. And then there were some T-shirts, and there were also some videos of my fieldwork in the shopping centre. And the speakers have... the grime rap track which I made with a local rapper we took the Argos catalog which is a shopping catalog and we took words out of it recombined them into a kind of poetry and then he rapped I'm not going to do I don't it's, it's, it always feels inappropriate he won't come he's got he's much cooler he's got better things to do um this is I don't think I really need to show any of the Oh, or just kind of for a second. She's got that don't judge me by my T-shirt off her chest. He's just checking. 
regulated wildness. You chase your dinner around the plate to trigger primordial pleasure points. Keep chasing. Werewolves. Fierceness. Yearning for your inner animal. But he's gone to habitat. The great indoors. Wild quotations that don't stand up anymore. Disorientated conglomerate landscapes kicked over by unicorn hoof shadows. But you're in 24-7-365 luminosity. The lights don't even go out here. You're applying photo filters that transplant nocturnal sources where your aging eyes were. Cuteness epidemic. Post-corporeal interspecies offspring. Screen size, so more can fit in the arc when the waters rise. But the closer you get, the further the arc appears. Farther and farther. Pigeons are rainbow-coloured if you look up close. Let's get out of here then, somewhere, anywhere. Only aliens believe in us now. They say the first stage is denial. <laughs> Immortal skins on skeletons. Elizabeth I kept a unicorn horn in her cabinet. A fake, probably a narwhal tusk. There was a big market for them then. Serious explorers scoured the globe hunting for mythical beasts. Gotta catch them all. Divide all the matter in the world up into unicorn-shaped chunks. The second phase is acceptance. Swap the fantasy for firearms. Capitalist masochism. We are warriors, rebels, uncapturable, free, with a giant barcode on the arm and the brand name, supply and demand. Brands brazenly quoting the economic strategies that they've used to reify your life hours. Oh. So I'll leave it just that, but you can watch more on my website or on my YouTube if you want. But it, this kind of selling of rebellion and selling of, like, the outsider, I think it is quite interesting because um, the... The unicorn as a sort of, um, I guess, a kind of like queer symbol or like a kind of outsider symbol that's co-opted. And there was unicorns. It was a, a proper epidemic of un unicorns in that shopping centre the whole time I was there. I mean, I love... She's got that don't oh, judge oh, me oh, by my... T oh. I love unicorns and everything, but... Um, I just got, I'm kind of, kind of over them now. I've seen so many. In there. Uh, so I also took deep dives into other spaces. So um, I made some radio programs where I analyze and overanalyze call center culture uh, and uh, AI as well. There's a bit in there. You can actually access them here. It's not just in the UK. Um, it's, it plays here as well. And the Argos catalog, which is a shopping catalog, kind of rereading it through um, the lens of the whole Earth catalog, which is a sort of 60s counterculture. Uh, people say that it's a precursor to the internet. Um, and the call center, I was reading that through, um, was it religious paintings of purgatory? So like kind of yeah, making spurious comparisons between things. Um, I'll have to hurry up. So I then did a residency in the house clearance section of a market in South London, which just sells all of the stuff. It just takes stuff from dead people's houses and then sells it without filtering at all. I like this because I thought it tells you a lot about capitalism. There's Bob's, like his whole puncher was worth a lot. It was priceless when... It was his and he was in the office and no one could touch it. And now that Bob's dead, it's in the house clearance section of Deptford Market and it's not really worth anything, like maybe 50p at Peter's stall up by the Albany. But um, then when we discover that it's Bob Marley's, then it, its price goes up exponentially. And so all the time, it, the prices of these things were shifting according to like what someone needed or who happened to be passing or if it was raining, they would all get rained on. And then the umbrellas would go up in price. Um, I have to be faster. But so lots of times I'm talking through these objects that I've just found kind of almost a moment before and trying to kind of analyze them and also using them as ways of shedding my own subjectivity and kind of um, becoming someone else, like opening up. There's something really nice about going through the house clearance section because you really, uh, you really kind of can shape shift. Through. There's, there's people's family photos and there's like their, their funeral pamphlets and that it feels really inappropriate in terms of like identity um, and in the way that maybe uh, ownership of identity becomes particularly relevant in the digital age. Like in depth of market, there is no 
uh, ethical uh, rule. It is literally anything from those houses is there, and it and it becomes anyone's. Um, one of my students had a like a pot of scabs, like from like bodily scabs that they just they bought at the market. Um, so I recommend it. Um, it's better than the shopping centre. I need to kind of stop in a second, but just, oh, there is a video that you can see on my on my website of me kind of going through the shopping centre. And there's a some fish. Oh, oh, oh. I'm going to not show you that. It, he's just saying some fish change sex. So you could maybe investigate that another time. Um, really quickly, just to say that I've been doing these one-hour holidays, which are um, a group of people go on a kind of fictional holiday together over the course of an hour, trying to find uh, ways of creating moments of togetherness where... Uh, so sort of fictional social scenarios can be enacted. And the same with this piece, which involved, um, it was a development of a project where I go to strangers' houses and do the cleaning with them. Um, and we plan how we would spend the rest of our lives together during that hour of cleaning. And this was a version of it which was playable by two strangers and they sorted socks while they planned how they'd spend the rest of their lives together using this questionnaire to make it a bit less um, awkward. And because uh, when you're cleaning, it isn't awkward when you're cleaning in the houses because there's something to do and they've invited you there and you don't know who they are and it's probably quite dangerous. Uh, and then I got props from, this was in an uh, art centre where there was a theatre prop room. And so after they'd filled in the questionnaires together, I would get props that related to their fictional or speculative futures. I think I need to kind of stop there, but there's lots of other things. Um, that, I mean, it's, it's just a sea monster committee that it was... I'll finish by talk, really quickly talking about this one. So, fanotourism is like a thing where people... Dark tourism, where people want to go to places where bad stuff has happened or scary stuff. So, the Loch Ness Monster makes millions of pounds for Scotland. And in Hastings, where this project was commissioned, it's quite a run-down town, and it has an art festival, and... They commissioned me to do something, and I thought, well, we need to attract a sea monster to Hastings because it's by the sea. And there are so many committees trying to regenerate Hastings that the first, the first thing to do would be to do a public survey to find out what sea monster they all wanted, like a focus group. So this is a sea monster committee where they felt inside of the pillowcase of objects and the... Uh, that was a way of mining their unconscious for what sea monsters they might be able to feel. And then we wrote them down, and then we did a little... We finished by doing a kind of ceremony where I talked... Where I kind of chanted the descriptions of the sea monsters with some of my friends who were playing instruments. And we were on top of a toilet block overlooking the sea. And we, had, we didn't... We're not sure if we attracted one, but um, we, we think it's kind of still on its way. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's me. There's lots more to say, but you can see on my website. Um, it's a kind of hacking practice, but I really don't know how to use a computer. So if anyone wants to collaborate with me, then just contact me. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Louise. We do have time for uh, two questions, maybe. So if you have one, please go to the mics. One, two, three, here in the room. Mic number one, please. Uh, hello. Um, I'm personally also working with like hacking public spaces. And I was interested in um, like when you're in these situations, um, like how you interact with the people, uh, like, do do you wear like that? Do you keep in being in that artistic role, or do you like reveal yourself as an artist? And like, um, how do you engage with the people if they they talk to you, if they say like explain yourself or something like that? Yeah, like most of the time, I don't appear to be an artist, and even I question the usefulness of that term um, because it could it could be so many other things but it's 
I guess when people do ask what I'm doing, I sometimes say I'm an artist because I think it's ambiguous enough and non-threatening enough for people to let you in. There's a sort of respect for artists, but also um, I think people who are not from an art background don't feel like an artist is superior to them. They think more like they're a kind of unusual, slightly mad character. And there's something really generous about the way that people treat an artist doing something unusual. Uh, and they don't close down. They kind of... It is an invitation to play, I think. So I do try to talk to people. I don't really say I'm an artist unless it becomes necessary to do that. Um, I'd rather let them be quite uncertain as to what it is. Like on the train, for example, people didn't know what it was, really. And it was quite tense because it's quite a poor area and there was people in the morning like drinking cans of beer and saying they didn't want me to talk to them. People thought I was like begging for money or a charity or they really didn't know what I was. And so the question mark as to what my motives were was a little bit... It felt a bit dangerous or weird or antagonistic in that situation. Um, but generally, uh, it, it seems like being an artist kind of opens up more and allows for a kind of outsider-ish position that people warm to, mostly. Unless you're kind of being a dickhead and sort of like authoritarian about that. I think being the sort of artist weirdo is a really great... Um, or being the idiot, I think being an artist and being an idiot can be a really nice combo. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> I think we're running out of time, so please, a uh, sh very short question. Oh, <laughs> okay. Uh, well, I just met you and I love your work. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, That's, That's a good wrap-up for today. So <laughs> let's thank again Louise Ashcroft for her wonderful talk. Well, if anyone wants to do something, just I really want... I think it's quite isolated. I feel quite isolated as an artist. I think tech culture has way more um, collaborative stuff going on, and I think like the art world really needs that, and it absolutely doesn't have that in, that much in London. So just get in touch and even just to share ideas and bounce them around. Um, so, yeah, thank you very much. Thanks again, Louise Ashcroft.